know what's there. Waiting. Beyond that beach. Immortality! Take it! It's yours! Hi there! Well, welcome to the inaugural episode of Oh My Gods. So before we dive into the actual topic, because this is the first episode, I think I should give a little bit of a background about myself and the direction this whole thing's heading towards. So I'm Danielle, I like to talk, so I feel like this is a pretty good way to talk about the things that I like, like Greek mythology, Greek mythology books, Greek mythology movies, and stuff like that. And I mean, I like other things too, but mythology has always had a special place in my heart. I come from a family of history nerds, so it was only a matter of time before I followed suit. I have an interest in all sorts of history because I think it's all super interesting, but Greek mythology is just something else, right? Fair warning number one, I do not have a full formal degree in history or mythology. I actually have an art degree from an art university. So my best option was to fill up my electives with whatever history course I could find. But maybe the lack of a degree is a good thing for you? I don't have a professor's opinion on which ancient poet was the correct one and who told the myth the best way. So instead, I like to go over the same myth, all the different ways it exists. And also, like, who am I to judge? These are fictional heroes, gods, and kings, right? And also, like, who am I to judge these fictional heroes, gods, and kings? Because most of them have, like, a greater purpose to explain the reason behind something that goes on in our cosmic universe, and others are there to be lessons on the human experience. And maybe, just maybe, some of them are being a little overanalyzed, and they're just characters that are being used for entertainment. Who knows? I don't know. I wasn't there when they were written, but like they weren't all peaches, okay? And that's kind of the reason why their stories were able to survive for like 2,000 years or so. But we can get more into that next week when we actually talk about a real Greek myth. Okay, so now let's explain why this episode isn't about a myth, but instead a 2004 blockbuster. So the main reason is to give a little glimpse into how I personally got into mythology. The second is we're going to talk about books, movies, and myths, so might as well start with the more interesting one first. And the third is I just really like this movie. Now, I know there's issues here, but show me a mythology movie that's 100% accurate. Okay, so let's go back to 2004. So this movie hit the theaters in the middle of May, so I would have been like eight, but this movie was also rated R, so obviously my parents weren't taking us to the theaters to go see it. But later on, when it had its DVD release, my mom probably saw it and like picked it up in like a Walmart or something. And then we watched it that night right after dinner. So FYI, my parents like movies and they used to let us watch whatever they were watching as long as it wasn't crazy scary or something. And yes, Troy is like a really sexy and violent movie, but watching not kid movies as a kid is where I got most of my favorite movies like Troy and the Fifth Element. So yeah, my parents weren't bad parents. They were great parents. Anyways, so we sit down on the big, cushy, brown suede living room set we had. And I remember it perfectly because my parents and my little brother were on the big three-seater sofa and I was sitting on the recliner with my legs crossed, looking at the TV on a little bit of an angle. So the room was like totally dark with the exception of the glow from the TV screen. We sat through the entire two hours and 43 minutes of this epic... Yes, you can actually call it an epic. And when my dad flicked the lamp on after the credit roll, I was a changed person. After gushing about it for like 10 minutes, asking all of these questions about what we just experienced, my dad got up from the couch and told me to follow him to my parents' bedroom. Once we get up there, he pulls two books off his bookshelf. The first was Chariots of the Gods by Eric von Daniken. And the second was this little brown book called The Magic of Myths and Legends by Beulah Swayze. I don't know if you've read or even heard of either of these books, but Chariots of the Gods is super interesting and it mostly goes over like ancient unsolved mysteries, kind of like ancient aliens. And the second one, I would be really surprised if anyone else out there had 
even ever heard of it because it's actually my dad's original textbook from his grade nine history class in 1961. And I can't even find a copy of it on Amazon or something like that. Like it's nowhere. But I'm going to go into more detail about these books and a bunch of other books later on. The point is, after he gave me these books, they never left my hands. I actually probably abused these books by bringing them to school with me every day. And now one of them has a cover I have to glue on every once in a while. But I became obsessed with mythology and I went out of my way to make as many parts of my life revolve around it. Mainly like school projects, like anyone where they let you choose the topic. It was going to be something about mythology, I can tell you that. And mom and dad, I, if you're listening, I actually have to come clean about something. In the fifth grade, I typed up a fake project outline based on one we had early in the year. And I said the point of the project was to create a diorama of a historical building. Diorama started happening more often as you got into the older grades. So like five, six, seven, eight. And that's probably what made me think of it. So anyways, I type up this fake project thing with a fake due date and I show it to my parents and I tell them, I want to make a model of the Parthenon. So a little bit more backstory information. Uh, my dad's also super into making like model planes and cars and we used to do it together like all the time. So a like crafty project like this wasn't too out of the realm of reality for my house. Anyways, um, so... Like for the next month, I spent every weekend in our basement with my dad making these little plaster molds for the columns from these plastic ones we found at a cake decorating shop and like drawing these little pencil crayon pictures that would then become the metapes. And then on the due date, he drove me to school and helped me bring it in. And honestly, I wonder what my teacher was thinking because he was like talking to her saying, oh, I guess we're the first ones here and whatever. But like, it wasn't a real project. And we were just walked in at 7.30 in the morning with this giant, heavy, wooden-based model of the Parthenon and plopped it down on the counter of the classroom and then left it there until the librarian asked to put it on display until the summer. I really couldn't tell you what anybody thought about it, honestly. I just really wanted to make one. And for some reason, I guess I figured making up a fake project would be the only way that could happen. I don't know. But recently I moved out on my own and there was no room in the car to bring that thing with me. Yes, of course I have it still. It was built encased in a giant plexiglass box, but I'll try to find a picture. But all of this started after seeing Troy for the first time. And now the rest of it is literal history. So let's get on into the actual movie. Okay, by the way, I don't think I really have to say this, but obviously, spoiler alert, but like this movie's 18 years old now. So if you haven't seen it, I'm sorry. Okay, yeah, wait, actually. So this is the idea and like the structure I have planned out for this. Weekly episodes, obviously, but we're going to go over a bunch of Greek myths and stories, like as many as exist, and I can find to retell. And then on top of that, we're going to like go through and review books and movies about Greek myths, like going through how accurate it is or not, um, the storyline they're trying to follow, and like production, because some of them have wild stories, like Troy, actually. So nowadays, I think the movie gets a bad rap for like two out of three major things, First, obviously, is there's no gods present. And they were like pretty involved with everything that like happened in Troy, but they're not here. Second is the same kind of thing. The 10 year war is shrunken down to like a month long thing. And then the third is the Patrocles, that's the cousin thing. But there is this little adage I discovered when I was researching all the movies made about mythology. And it goes like this. The history professor says, do you like history films? The student says, yes. The history professor replies, would you like not to? So like, yeah, I'm going to pick apart all the little changes they made to the original story. But even with all of the critique of this and literally every other movie like it, at the end of the day, they are still mostly great movies. So the way I see it is you have to like separate the facts and the entertainment of it all, right? Like it's not a new or profound thought, but like I'm just saying that because I still love these movies no matter how much is technically incorrect. Anyways, so if you're not familiar with the movie Troy, 
It's a 2004 movie that was based upon Homer's Iliad, as well as the post-America, literally meaning after Homer, by another lesser-known Greek poet, Quintus Samarius. Now, this is because where the Iliad actually ends is with Hector's death and then his funeral. And Homer's Odyssey picks the story back up after the city has already fallen and it's time for the Greeks to start returning home. So that missing middle part that's shown in the film is based upon the other guy's poem. And it tells the story from right after the funeral of Prince Hector all the way up to the actual fall of Troy. And I mean, the destruction of the city is really the money shot, so you can't blame them for creating a mashup, right? So to retell the story through the eyes of the director, Wolfgang Peterson, awesome name, right? He chooses a literal star-studded cast to fill the ranks. But keep in mind, this is only 2004, so a lot of these actors actually weren't the big hot things that they are now, like the lead. So the lead, Brad Pitt as Achilles, then Eric Bana as Hector, Orlando Bloom as Paris, Diane Kruger as Helen, Peter O'Toole as Priam, Brian Cox as Agamemnon, Rose Byrne as Briseis, Sean Bean as Odysseus, Saffron Burroughs as Andromache, Julie Christie as Thetis, Brendan Gleeson as Menelaus, John Shrapnel as Nestor, James Cosmo as Glaucus, Julian Glover as Triopas, King of Thessaly, Garrett Hedlund as Patrocles, Tyler Maine as Ajax, and Vincent Regan as Eudorus as Achilles' right-hand man. And these are just like the big names who played the original characters. So huge thing there. Most of the leads were just about to enter their prime during the early 2000s. So I assume this was a pretty big deal for them to be working with all of these more seasoned actors like Peter O'Toole and Julie Christie. And apparently, Brad isn't too thrilled that he had to be in this major movie, but rather was somewhat of a contractual obligation. But his main beef was like the style of the movie and the art direction. Everything was centered literally and centered around him as well. But either way, I don't know anyone who has a problem with Brad Pitt being here. Oh yeah, and the role of Briseis was apparently offered to Ashwarya Rai, but she turned it down because she didn't love the idea of the more racy scenes between Briseis and Achilles in the tent. So besides the crazy star-studded cast, the production for this movie was also incredible. And this is something that like really deserves a little bit more praise. There were two main filming locations, Mexico and Malta, which I think is pretty cool but like totally makes sense to film in Malta because it's like literally right there in the middle of the Mediterranean. And apparently they offer a much better financial incentive to film companies. And plus it's like so tiny, you can drive across a whole island in like an hour. So commuting is much better. And it's like so little. So I'm actually Maltese. And usually when people ask me what my background is and I say Maltese most of the time, but not all the time, no one has ever heard of it. So I have to be like, oh, it's this tiny island between Libya and Italy. So I personally think it's always super cool when things are, when big things are filmed there because it was like also the backdrop for Gladiator for similar reasons and like Game of Thrones, but I think mostly just in the first season, but like other stuff like that too. So they film some major scenes in Malta, like where Achilles and Patrocles are seen sparring and Odysseus, Sean Bean. Um, asks Achilles to join and when the ships are seen sailing onto the Trojan shore that was filmed in the Gahan Tagiana Bay being the same location where Paris and Priam find the gigantic wedding horse and then like most importantly the Maltese film studio located in Calcara was used to create the city of Troy so like the part you see burned down and the funny thing I found out from the behind the scenes which is it worth the entire watch is apparently when they were burning down the city, the Maltese firemen were being a little bit too cautious and they kept extinguishing the flames before they could actually like finish shooting, which I think is pretty funny. But the real dramatic and intense scenes, other than like the sacking of an entire city where like everybody except for like 50 people die, were the intense wide shot battle and fight scenes. Honestly, up until I made myself rewatch this movie like five times to fully take it all in and have it fresh in my mind to talk about, I could never watch 
uh, the one-on-one combat scenes, mainly between Paris and Menelaus, um, because it made me like so sad to see Orlando Bloom like that. And it was like pity and secondhand embarrassment all rolled into one. But I did watch it and I watched them all. And the sadder one is definitely when Brad Pitt drives that sword through Eric Bana's chest. Like, I know it's coming, but it makes me sad every time. But the cool part is actually the scene between Brad and Eric. No stunt doubles required. So it's like the two of them actually jumping and lunging at each other. And I mean, like, I know they weren't actually maiming each other, but I think it's so much more interesting when it's the actors doing the hard stuff. But yeah, so anyways... Whereas the actual city of Troy was filmed in Malta, the Trojan wall scenes were done in Mexico. This was supposed to be done originally in Morocco, which is like a lot closer to Malta. So it makes sense in that way. And they also needed like a very long beach so they could do those massive battle scenes. And the beaches in Malta are like teeny tiny. Like the biggest one is only 800 meters. But because of international tensions at the time, they they packed up everything and shipped the entire production to Mexico instead. And apparently that decision was because someone in the crew had a coffee table book with the Baja beaches. And like the look there was obviously right, which ended up working out mostly perfectly fine. So in Mexico, in Cabo San Lucas, they built the Temple of Apollo, the Greek camp, as well as the massive 40 foot Trojan wall and its 60 foot gate. So even though the Mexican beach was beautiful and pristine and just like perfect, she was a cruel mistress. During production, Hurricane Marty decided to rip through the entire set, pretty much annihilating the Trojan Wall that had been constructed, tearing some of the Greek ships in half, and pretty much just making an entire messy setback on everything. But in some ways, the decision they made to like rebuild the wall rather than try something else that would make up for lost time ended up working out for them. Because you won't believe this, but Brad Pitt allegedly actually injured his Achilles tendon doing all the jumping and fighting um, that his Achilles did. So he was down for the count for a while too. But even with all the setbacks and hardships that came with this production, I mean, they still did it. They made a beautiful movie with real sets. And they also hired a team of developers to create their own CGI software because they needed one that was going to be way too expensive if they had bought it. And also a side note for production, little nice thing, because I know some people have their reservations about things like this coming in and taking over an ecosystem for a couple months. But a really nice thing that they actually had to set up was like this little turtle nursery to protect and release the baby turtles into the ocean without any disturbances from the film set. And like, I get that they literally had to do it or else they wouldn't been able to film there, but I still think it's sweet. But enough with the sweet. It's time to go through the real movie now. All right, fair warning number two. I'm not a film critic, okay? Um, I like movies and I like talking about movies that's it. So I just want to put that out there. Okay, so Troy from the very top. So like I said, a thing that this movie often gets points taken away from is the fact that there's absolutely no mystical representation of any of the gods in this movie. The director said this was partly a time issue because they were trying to decide what would be best for the movie on audiences. So there are like many things that change for this reason, but leaving out the gods also grounded the movie and made it more about human decisions and destiny rather than having mortals being wildly influenced by the immortals. So because of this, there is no slight from the Olympians that leads to the Ferris of the Mall apple. So there is no bribe for Paris. So smuggling Helen away back to Troy is something that they just did. And it comes back to bite them the entire film. But with taking the gods out, there's a lot of things that were supposed to be done, like almost what can be described as by an invisible force that just happened more like a series of truly unfortunate events. Anyway, so now you know there are no gods here. Well, actually, there's technically the appearance of one, Thetis, who's a sea goddess and the mother of Achilles. But in Troy, she's just like a regular old lady who stands in the water and talks to her son once. And like, of course... They are worshipping and interpreting signs from the gods the same way we do in real life, but there's no like direct interaction that's usually present in these myths. Okay, so after the introduction of what has led us to this moment in history, explaining that by now most of the Greek states 
are all being ruled under the will of King Agamemnon, the king of kings, except for Thessaly, which is currently being ruled by King Triopas. So the two kings agree and decide to let their two greatest warriors have their own quick little one-on-one -on -one so more men don't have to die. Triopas calls out this massive man, Boagrius, who is played by Nathan Jones, an Australian powerlifting champion. You can tell from his size, he's huge. <laughs> He's 6'11", actually. And then, of course, Agamemnon calls out for his champion, Achilles, who is nowhere to be found amongst the ranks. Achilles! And it's so embarrassing because Triopas thinks he's got this one in the bag. So then we cut to the scene where Brad Pitt is butt naked. And the boy that was sent to fetch him asks, Oh, are the stories about you true? And then here, the boy mentions that there are rumors that Achilles is the son of an immortal goddess and that he is also immortal. So you're like, oh, okay, yeah. And then Brad drops probably one of the hardest lines of the entire movie, which he uses to obliterate this poor kid. Just before Achilles takes off to go fight, the kid mentions that he would be afraid to fight Boagrius because of his incredible size. And Achilles simply says, and that's why no one will remember your name. And then just rides off. The Thessalonian you're fighting. He's the biggest man I've ever seen. I wouldn't want to fight him. That's why no one will remember your name. It is not unknown that having your name and memory live through the ages was like a pretty big deal for these mythological heroes because it meant your legacy and triumphs, in most cases triumphs, have lasted far longer than the dust from your bones, right? But I think it's a great line because it kind of already shows that he's in it all for the glory because he knows he's capable of it, even though he hasn't necessarily been put in the position yet to have some type of grand victory. But just wait. So anyways, Achilles shows up to battle, and of course, in the very beginning of the movie, they also drop a hint towards Achilles and Agamemnon not liking each other at all. So when Achilles gets there, the king tries to like flex his authority over him, and being like a petty and defiant warlord, he tells the king to go fight his own war then. After some talking down by old King Nestor, the advisor to Agamemnon, Achilles continues on with the 1v1, even though he's like not doing it to unite Greece, but more so for the same reason the kings wanted, so fewer men would have to die fighting. So if you've seen the film before, you understand when I say that Achilles does a lot of his jump fighting, and the, the fight choreography was designed in a way supposed to mimic someone whose movements are so quick and fluid that you don't even know what's happened until... Well, until there's a knife in your trapezius. So to give him a godlike fighting style, the stunt coordinators actually had to develop one that was a combination of many different fighting styles slash techniques and other bits of athleticism. A little bit from boxing, from speed skating, from martial arts, and maybe even a couple moves taken from Keanu in The Matrix. All come together in a way that has Achilles literally always having the upper hand. Once Achilles finished off the Thessalian hero, they were officially a Greek state under Agamemnon, which turns out to be a good thing for him after what happens next. After the battle scene is over, we jump to a celebration taking place between the Trojan princes, Hello Paris and Hector! and King Menelaus, the brother of Agamemnon and King of Sparta, who in a touching yet short speech welcomes peace between Greek and Troy, even though they were enemies in the past. The two young princes are acting as dignitaries representing their father, King Priam, and Troy on this little peace mission, but it turns out Paris has other plans. So this is another part of the film that's a major departure from the original storyline in the Iliad, First of all, the role the goddesses play is largely behind all of this, and it's not here. Okay, so quickly go over this story. So the goddess of strife, Eris, didn't get invited to a party, so she showed up anyways, of course, and carved to the fairest one on a golden apple that she then tossed on the table 
and landed between Athena, Aphrodite, and Hera, leading to, obviously, them fighting over who was the fairest one, each claiming it was themselves. Not wanting to get in the middle of a disagreement, Zeus recommended letting Prince Paris choose. So, when the prince was approached by the three goddesses, who are oftentimes either clothed, partially clothed, or not clothed at all, they all offer him different gifts to bribe him into picking them. Ultimately, he goes for Aphrodite's offer to give him the most beautiful woman in the world, Helen of Sparta. And then he sailed to Sparta and abducted her. But we'll go more into that when we actually go over the real Ilion. So obviously, the big difference here was made to get rid of a lot more sinister details and replace them with a romantic and mutual but forbidden love between Paris and Helen. And I get it because like her running away willfully makes it like a little bit more painful for Menelaus. Following all the hard work that their father did to create peace between the two nations, it all fell apart over one seashell necklace. And yes, a necklace with a modern clasp. Hector, who is rightfully mad at Paris for what he's done, sort of foreshadows his own fate when he's dressing down his brother at the side of the ship and asks him if he knows what it's like to truly be in love or what it's like to actually kill somebody. You say you want to die for love, but you know nothing about dying and you know nothing about love. All the same, I go with her. I won't ask you to fight my war. You already have. Because the answer is no. But Hector has. So yeah, Paris talks a big game, but Big Brother knows he can't back it up. And then Paris goes, well, I won't ask you to fight my war, but obviously we know this doesn't end up being the case. Okay, so now this is what I consider, I guess, a minor mistake or a creative liberty that was taken by production, but I honestly, in good faith, will argue against it because I like to think that there is a possibility this could have made sense and I really just agree with the customers. But so there's this thing that is deemed as a historical mistake in the movie and it's all of this blue colored clothing worn by the Trojans and Brad Pitt honestly too. And they literally all wear it all the time except for like funerals of course. Now when Homer was writing the Iliad, it was somewhere around 760 BCE, right? So now in the Iliad and many other ancient texts, not just from Greek culture, but historical texts from all over the world, things are often described as the wrong color, according to our modern colors. It's not because things were different or they couldn't see colors the same way we do, but it's suggested that it was just colors were more broadly clumped together. And because blue wasn't really a color that was common in the sense like you can touch it all the time, we never made a word for it until it became reality. So in 760 BCE, it is likely that ancient Greece probably didn't have blue dye. But then in 300-ish BC, they then invaded Egypt, right? And Egypt had loads of blue. It was everywhere. So that's where it's assumed that the Greeks and Romans got blue, but the Egyptians were getting their blue dye from some semi-precious stones, but they actually apparently loved the color so much. They found a workaround and started making their own blue dye by combining a special blend of minerals and sand to make Egyptian blue or cerulean blue. But in many other European countries, there is this flowering plant called woad, and apparently if you grind the dried leaves and mix the powder with manure, you get another version of indigo dye. And this woad plant just so happens to originate from Turkey. So I mean, maybe it isn't totally impossible that the Trojans were able to use so much blue in their wardrobe of the royalty and the priests. But I think it's just so harsh to say that there's no way that they knew what blue was when the war took place. But aside from that, there are other little things about the costume design that aren't a thousand percent accurate, but it comes down to like aesthetics again. So anyways, after Paris shows the stolen Helen to Hector, he ping-pongs around what should be done with the stowaway and then decides to just sail home and deal with it there with a firm word from his father. Now, Menelaus is pissed, rightfully. So he does what any little brother does with an issue. He goes and asks big brother for help. The loving and caring Agamemnon embraces his brother's misfortune and offers to help the both of them by going to war with Troy. 
So the thing with Troy and why it's such a big task to achieve is that the city is surrounded by these impenetrable walls. So conquering armies stand no chance at taking a city if they can't get inside it. But now that Agamemnon has all of Greece united, he believes that things will go his way. Nestor, who is the king of Pylos in the Iliad, but appears to be only a royal advisor to Agamemnon, piped up and said that if they're assembling all of Greece, then they would need the help from Achilles and the Myrmidons. Most of the conflict on the Greece side stems from the dislike that King Agamemnon and Achilles have for each other. Achilles doesn't like him because he doesn't respect the way that he handles his power, and Agamemnon can't stand Achilles because he cannot be controlled and he knows it. So in order to get Achilles and his killing abilities to join the war, they decide to send good old Odysseus out, played by Sean Bean. Odysseus arrives in Pythia and interrupts a sparring session between Achilles and his younger cousin, Patrocles. This tweak to the storyline is definitely the most criticized out of all of the creative liberties that the writers and directors decided to go ahead with. I mean, it's not that much of a stretch from what's actually stated in the Iliad and the lineage of the Greek mythology, so I get why they decided to use that older brother type relationship between the two of them. So in the Iliad, it does not actually ever come out and bluntly say that they were in fact lovers. Obviously, there are things that have led many to the conclusion that, uh, yeah, they're clearly boyfriends, but it's all interpretation, right? They did love each other, and that's for sure. And if you look at the characters' family trees, they are cousins. Not that being family ever stopped a couple of ancient Greeks from being together. But this movie does obviously focus on the straight relationship Achilles has with Briseis. And because he's only ever shown romantically with her, then his sexuality is assumed straight. But the character himself has been known to have quite a few lovers or companions. So I'm not saying he's not definitely gay, but I think it's best to label him as bi and also label him as fictional. And his relationship with his cousin Patrocles, who technically should be the older one, but I know that kind of makes looking up to him slash wanting to be like him not work as well. So I get that too with some sort of love. And they do show the love the two had for each other. It's just not romantic here. Moving on. So anyways, Achilles and his cousin are told about the upcoming war with Troy, and he has little to no interest in fighting the Trojans in order to reclaim the lost dignity of Menelaus and his brother. So this is filmed on the rocky cliffs of Molina Bay. And even though there are many ruined sites all over the tiny country that resemble the one that the pair of cousins are seen practicing their swordplay in, this set was completely constructed by production. And although Achilles seems hesitant, Odysseus keeps drilling him and stroking his ego, mentioning the size of the fleet and the mark it will leave on history. By the end of the conversation, it seems to have swayed him more through the idea of honor and legacy. To help him make this decision of whether or not to sail to Troy with the rest of Greece, he consults his mother, Thetis, played by Julie Christie. So she is the one who's supposed to be the immortal sea nymph, and Achilles' father, who's only ever mentioned by name and a tiny bit by reputation, is actually the mortal Greek hero Peleus. In the movie, he's not around. I suppose this was a commentary on how most Greek men died in battle. But in the original story, Peleus lives to see his own son unfortunately murdered. So Thetis tells Achilles of his destiny that he pretty much has two options. Stay at home, raise a loving family, and be forgotten. Or go to war, die as a hero whose name will be remembered forever. There's no mention of the dipping in the river Styx or the heel. But she does tell him that she knew he would be asked to fight in this war long before he was born. So they do stick a little bit more to Homer's version by omitting these details that were added to the story later on. Well, after hearing the two options, A, go down in history for all of time, or B, die a nobody, guess what the honorable warlord chose? Next, we jump to the fleet of ships sailing across the Aegean Sea to Troy. The Myrmidons aboard their ship with black sails is seen cutting through the waves in line with the other 999 boats. So logistically, I don't know if this necessarily makes sense, but I guess they got up and started talking about war as soon as they realized Helen left with Paris. But the Greek army of a thousand ships is already on their way to Troy as the two princes and the ex-queen 
arrive home. It's apparently 300 or so nautical miles between Sparta, um, between Alus and Troy. So if you do the math based on how fast they assume ancient Greek warships could travel, it's just about two days. So that's like super quick turnaround time to get an entire country together and at sea. After entering the city, Helen is understandably caught a little bit off guard by the grandeur and size of Troy. With its massive structures and statues, and also the city's display of admiration for their returning princes. As they ride to the city, there are women seen whispering gossip about the new woman standing next to Paris. So now, the Greeks are on their way, and the Trojans are aware, but Hector is hoping that his father will send Helen home to prevent any issues with the Greeks from actually coming to fruition. But instead of doing that, King Priam welcomes her into their kingdom and calls her daughter of Troy, essentially blessing her presence. Here we are also introduced to the other women of Troy, Andromache, the wife of Hector and mother of his son, who is just a baby in most retellings. And he's a baby here. And the other girl we meet is young Briseis. So in the movie, she is the cousin of Hector in Paris, who has just become a devoted servant of Apollo, aka a virgin. There's a lot of foreshadowing. But in the original story, she is none of these things. She is a wife of a Theban prince, and she was stolen by Achilles after he raided her city. But more on that later. There are a couple of women also missing. Most notably is Cassandra. And this is partly because the role she played is pretty much taken over by Rose Burns Briseis. But Cassandra was the priestess of Apollo who was cursed to tell true prophecies that no one would ever believe. She actually tells Paris that if he goes to Sparta and gets Helen, then he will lead to the fall of Troy. She actually has a large role in how the mortals react to the war that they're caught up in, but none of the storyline is included in the movie, so there's no Cassandra. Anyways, after I think the realization of what they've actually done starts to set in, Helen and Paris, alone in their room, overlooking the sea, waiting for the armies to arrive, discuss a plan to run away, take off on horseback, and never return. Paris says, it's okay because Helen left her home for him, so now he wants to leave his home for her. Helen then starts to explain the relationship with Menelaus, which is a little mixed up from what it actually was, but once again, this is for the sake of the movie and to further push the idea of the loveless marriage and the long-suffering young wife. Helen tells Paris that she was 16 years old when her parents shipped her off to Sparta to marry Menelaus. Helen was already the princess of Sparta, before she met Menelaus, but anyways. Sounding like an idealist, the same way he did when he was trying to convince his older brother on the ship home that he was brave enough to keep Helen, Paris goes on to dream up a life where the two of them are living off the land without all the luxuries they've both grown up surrounded by. Sounds good. But what happens when the Greeks show up and can't find Helen? It's a lose-lose situation, but at least they stand a chance if the Trojans fight back. The size of the city of Troy, something that was also a little exaggerated for the sake of making this movie, matched the epic tale it was retelling. And while yes, this is a fictional story, it has been proven that where the ancient city of Troy was located, there is evidence that there may have been even more than one great war fought on its land. And the city there, while even though some of it still stands, was absolutely nothing like the one that was recreated here. The set designer said they did take inspiration from Egyptian cities, just like for the size and scale that they were able to accomplish, as well as like the integration of statues into structures as can be seen all throughout the city. Then the wall, I mean, the wall is 40 feet tall. That's huge. That's why it looks so menacing to these approaching men with wooden spears and brass swords. What are they gonna do against a 40 foot anything? The next morning, we see the Trojans preparing to take the Greek attack head on. They're setting up a line of a bati along the shore, soldiers are taking up positions in the sand, and the worshippers of the sun god are offering sacrifices for his protection. And then the bell rings. All of a sudden, the horizon is dotted with all these little white sails from the thousand ships. The movie used a lot of real extras, which is pretty cool for modern movies. 
So a lot of the people you see, with the exception of like the vast armies, are actually real people. So now that the Greeks are close enough to smell victory, Achilles and the Myrmidons take the lead and are ready to run right up into the sand. And of course, this ticks off Agamemnon because what doesn't? But Achilles actually wasn't the first to reach the beach of Troy. But if that was the case here, Brad Pitt's speech wouldn't carry as much weight. Myrmidons, my brothers of the sword, I'd rather fight beside you than any army of thousands. Let no man forget how menacing we are. We are lions. Do you know what's there? Waiting beyond that beach. Immortality. Take it. It's yours. I don't know if everyone who watches this feels the same way, but throughout all of the conflicts, I'm torn on whose side I'm supposed to be on. Every counterattack has me switching loyalties, but really only when it's the Greeks as in Brad Pitt and Sean Bean against the Trojans. So like for majority of the battle, I want everyone to win, but lol, it's not realistic. So anyway, so they land and bam, they're immediately met with a flurry of flaming arrows from the Trojan archers. A few men are taken out, but they quickly regroup after pushing forward and use a testudo formation for protection as they advance. With only 50 men minus a couple, they make a pretty good progress taking the beach. And this is the first demonstration of like actual warfare in the movie. And the use of weapons starts out pretty good. The foot soldiers are mostly reliant on spears and arrows, with the use of a sword only coming in after the spears are no longer an option. I mean, one guy even uses a rock to smash a Trojan soldier's head in. There is more of this also seen later on when Achilles and Hector battle one-on-one. -on -one. Once the rest of the Greeks start to show up, the day looks like it belongs to them. But as Hector already mentioned, there are a lot more of them than there are Trojans. Plus, a bunch of them are still on their farms in the country while this is happening. We get to see a little flash here of Ajax the Great, and we know it's him because he yells his own name while entering battle. I am Ajax, breaker of stones! Look upon me and despair! Then, all of the Greeks on ships that haven't made it to the shore yet start chanting Achilles' name from the sea, and guess who gets mad over this? Greek soldiers keep on pouring in, and even though Hector has arrived with additional soldiers, it's not looking too good for them. So they begin to retreat back to their city. At this point, Achilles and the Myrmidons claim the Temple of Apollo that was overlooking the coastline. Inside, there are treasures that Achilles says are the rightful fruits of war that his men deserve. Eudorus, played by Vincent Regan, suggests that perhaps it's probably not the best idea to ransack through the temple of a god who sees literally all during the day. And Achilles, a very reasonable man, lops off the head of a solid gold statue sitting at the entry of the temple. Probably not the best idea, but whatever. Hector gets a front row seat to the power and skill that Achilles possesses as he rides to confront the small group of soldiers who have taken over the temple and killed their priests. The two leaders have a somewhat civil conversation demonstrating their respect as skilled warriors that they have for each other and also letting us know that Achilles is looking to fight the great Prince Hector with an audience present. And Hector doesn't really have the same motivators as he does. Back in the Greek camp is where we find Briseis again. Remember how Achilles told them to take the treasure in the temple? Well, they took her. And even though she is treated a little roughly by Achilles when he is first gifted her, overall he does treat her very well. And that's true to the original storyline as well. So this is where they kind of talk about the gods a little bit more. Well, really just Achilles, because he's supposed to be a demigod, right? But as Rome's burn is going on about how Apollo is going to get revenge for what he has done, Achilles starts to go on kind of talking down to them. He mentions that he's seen them, but they still don't show up anywhere. He seems to be the only one that has any concrete proof they exist. Like I said before, everyone else only gets to believe in the gods, not experience them. After a little spat with Agamemnon over who really won the beach, a bloodied and roughed up Briseis gets dragged in and the King of Kings reveals that he's keeping her. This doesn't sit well with Achilles. Back in Troy, a bunch of old men are talking to themselves, claiming victory based on bird signs. 
I spoke with two farmers today. They saw an eagle flying with a serpent clutched in its talons. This is a sign from Apollo. We will win a great victory tomorrow. Bird signs. You want to plan a strategy based on bird signs. Then Dummel Paris pipes up and offers to challenge Menelaus to a one-on-one -on -one combat over Helen's hand. And nobody likes this idea. Helen even tries to sneak away back to the Greek camp to keep her young lover from fighting. So now, day two of the 10-day war, pissed Achilles orders his men to stay behind. They're not fighting anymore after what transpired between him, Agamemnon, and Briseis. Big day though, the Greeks march all the way up to the towering walls of Troy to watch the single combat fight between King Menelaus and young Prince Paris. So usually, this is the part of the movie that I have to skip over, because I couldn't handle the second-hand embarrassment from Orlando Bloom's character crawling on his knees and sniveling in his brother's legs you after acting can't. all brave and Fight tough. Me. The bravest thing he does is return to the battlefield to fetch the Sword of Troy after the army starts to attack. But I mean, Orlando also obviously recognizes that Paris is meant to be like an all-bark, no-bite, hopeless romantic coward. He sees himself taking on these great feats, but he can never actually seem to live up to them. And then when Eric Bana draws out his sword and rams it through Menelaus' chest, it makes everything so much worse. But this little bit actually doesn't line up with the original story. Menelaus and Helen actually reunite. There's a couple different tellings of the exact situation, but yeah, they get back together and return to Sparta. Weird, right? Sorry if that is any kind of spoiler alert for you. One thing that Troy actually gets a lot of credit for is like the use of its weaponry props, but it should be mentioned that it has been suggested that the bronze swords that they're using wouldn't necessarily have the structural power to fully penetrate someone's chest and like come out the other side, especially like through armor. Anyways, another full-on war scene breaks out in front of the gates of Troy, and here you see the mid-battle brawl between Hector and Ajax, but Hector actually delivers a secondary sword through the chest, killing the hero, not exchanging gifts the way like they should have. Trying to attack against the walls of Troy doesn't go well for the Greeks and they are forced to retreat back to the shoreline. Ajax's corpse is then seen on a funeral pyre that night waiting to be cremated along with the rest of the Greeks that were slain. To make up for the defeat, Agamemnon gives Perseus to the men to cheer them up. And of course, they just start assaulting her. Then Brad Pitt shows up and starts beating them off with a red hot branding iron that was meant to be used on her. He then takes her back to his tent. How romantic. And then after a little heart to heart conversation, they talk about their destiny and their beliefs and why the mortals are better off than the immortals. The ability to love and lose, it's the envy of the gods. But these are the scenes that made Aishwarya Rai turn down the role. But I mean, being in bed with Brad Pitt, lying against the sheepskin, how terrible must this have been for Rose, really? But no, no, I get it, I get it. After the night the two share, Achilles decides to no longer fight and wants to leave the war behind. Drunk off the victory of battle, the old men of Troy want to attack the Greeks at the shore and send them sailing home. But Hector makes a very good point of recognizing that Achilles and the Myrmidons didn't fight Ergo, there must be some issue among this newly formed clump of Greek nations, and that it's best to not do something that would unify them. But of course, his rational reservations are dismissed, and then the Trojans attack the Greeks anyways, because they have the blessing of Apollo. This is where it gets dicey. So Achilles says, yeah, I'm done, we're done, let's go home. But his younger and eager to make his name for himself cousin isn't done. 
So instead of packing up the ship, what does he do? He steals Achilles' armor, pops his helmet on, and takes the training his cousin gave him and leads Achilles' men into battle. The problem is that everyone thinks Patrocles is Achilles. And I mean, he's doing well. He's using the fighting techniques that his older cousin taught him. But in the middle of the battle, he ends up in a one-on-one -on -one duel with Hector, the greatest warrior of Troy. As the rest of the men stand back and stop fighting to watch what is surely going to be the most thrilling and anticipated matchup of the entire war, Hector versus Achilles. And although at first glance, they seem to be matched in skill, the level of perfection is not there in Achilles' moves. Hector is making all of the offensive strikes. So when Hector slashes his throat open in what looks like an almost accidental blow, shock and disbelief cover the men's faces until merciful Hector removes his helmet and reveals young Patrocles gasping for his final breaths, choking on his own blood. After he puts Patrocles out of his misery, they call it quits for the day of war. So this mistake is made by Hector in the original story as well, but it is done mainly by the gods who make it appear as if Patrocles actually is Achilles. And the real Hector is a little bit less civil as he takes Achilles' armor as his own kind of trophy. And this is what really sets Achilles off. But in the movie, they leave Patrocles' body in the care of the Greeks so they can perform the proper burial rituals. As the men all return to the Greek camp, Brad Pitt's Achilles is angered by the Myrmidon's disobedience. But as Eudorus tries to explain, we thought it was you, aka we thought Patrocles was you. I didn't lead them, my lord. We thought you did. Where's Patrocles? And the loss of his cousin really sets Achilles' new determination to ruin the Trojans through revenge, and Hector knows his wrath is forthcoming. Before the dawn, Prince Paris is also caught practicing his archery skills alone, and against the straw dummy, all of his arrows are landing directly in the chest. So now he's surely going to be a solid shot, right? No. Well, okay, kind of. So now on day four of the 10 day war, the moment everyone has been waiting for, Achilles rides to the gates of Troy alone and challenges Hector. Now Hector gets to say his goodbyes to his family and even Helen and walk with no fear to his death waiting behind the gates. Hector! 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 And I mean, it probably took Eric Bana a couple of minutes to get down from the very, very top of the walls where he was watching Achilles approach. So, I mean, Brad Pitt would have been nearly out of breath yelling his name every 10 seconds. He actually yells it nine times during the movie. As the gates open, Hector approaches Achilles and begins the conversation with an apology. But Achilles is out only for blood. That's literally why he's here. There are no pacts between lions and men. The two warriors remove their helmets so they are certain of who they're actually fighting. The difference is obvious, though, as the fight goes on, that there was a big gap in the skills between the two cousins. Brad Pitt's fighting style is much more intense and every move has a direct intention, but it is now clear to the audience that these two really are the best of Greece and Troy. I mean, this is a dramatic and epic movie, so that's why everything is so dramatic, especially the fighting. So this is the scene that Eric Bana and Brad Pitt actually did together, no stunt doubles required, which I think is pretty cool. x one takes six. Okay. And action. So apparently the two of them had a little deal or bet that if you hit the other guy, you owed them money. 50 bucks for every light tap and 100 for every harder hit. 
And Brad, who was definitely the aggressor in the fight, owed Eric, who was mostly just blocking and defending, 750 bucks at the end of the day. But the fight sequence is about three minutes long, and I don't know how many takes I needed to get it all, but that's a lot of physical movement for the two men. And so that's what makes it a little bit more, you know, just like more. Versus having like two stunt guys and a couple of like weirdly chopped up clips where sometimes you see their face and sometimes they're covering their face. So it's just, it makes it cooler to know that it's actually the two real actors doing this fight. Another great part from the behind the scenes is when you can actually see Hector approaching Achilles, but Eric is only dressed as a Greek prince from the waist up. Hector is the only honorable one who seems to do the right thing when it needs to be done. And that's what makes his death a little bit harder. Get up, Prince of Troy. Get up. Won't let a stone take my glory. This is the part I can't watch. I usually just skip over it from here. So then following the fight, Achilles, as we know, gets the upper hand and shoves the broken spear through Hector's heart, a little symbolic. And then the prince falls to the dirt where he's finished off by a sword through the chest, same as Hector did to Patrocles the day before. So before the two started fighting, Hector offered out a pact that the winner would let the loser be given a proper funeral. And Achilles denied it and then follows it up with a giant middle finger to the Trojans by, of course, tying Hector's dead body to a rope and then attaching it to his chariot and then dragging him all the way back to the Greek encampment on the beach. In the middle of the night, old King Priam dares to cross into the Greek camp on the beach and find Achilles' tent. How did he know whose tent was who without the help of Hermes? Anyways, so he begs Achilles to relinquish the body of his dead son so he can be properly sent into the afterlife. And this was because it was a big deal. If you remember earlier when the Greeks tried to attack against the Trojans in front of the city walls and they had to retreat, Hector gave the enemy time to collect their dead. And then that night, all those who had fallen were burned on funeral pyres. In ancient Greek mythology, not having a proper funeral was considered the highest offense someone could commit against someone who's already dead because their soul will never know rest, as well as an offense to all of the gods. Achilles understands what Priam was saying, and obviously he makes him feel guilty for taking his rage out against Prince Hector, and in general all of the death he's caused, by bringing up his father, who in the movie has already died. He then goes back out to the side of his tent and starts to cry over Hector's body lying in the sand. Another super sad part. And Brad Pitt licks up his tears off his cheeks just like the rest of us. Taking it upon himself to make diplomatic decisions, Achilles offers the Trojans 12 days to host their funeral games in honor of Priam's eldest son, and also releases Perseus back into the arms of her uncle. And this is where the Iliad ends. You are supposed to fill in the blanks of what happened next with the Trojan horse and the sacking of Troy, but it is not described here. So to fill in the rest of what happened to the city of Troy, the storyline now begins to follow the post-Homer story, post-Homerica, literally meaning after Homer, by Quintus Samarius. Even though the storyline that Troy follows is commonly understood to be what happens during the Iliad, it is more the full story that was mashed up and molded over time with a new edition of new poems and stories like this. Following Hector's release, the fortnight of peace doesn't sound like something Agamemnon would offer, and he wants to abandon the deal made between Achilles and Priam. After the meeting between all of the Greek kings, Odysseus, the wise and cunning king of Ithaca gets the idea of using a horse after watching a fellow soldier whittle one out of wood. Construction then begins. The two weeks go by and the Trojans are alerted that the Greeks have fled from the beach, leaving only a couple of men who have been ravaged by the plague and a massive 40-foot-tall wooden horse built from pieces of the ships. 
they literally brought a thousand ships and it's about 50 men each ship so i guess enough have died to sacrifice at least a couple to construct the famous trojan horse now in a flip considering his older brother is gone paris suggested destroying the horse instead of bringing it to the temple of poseidon inside their city too bad nobody listened to him a major celebration breaks out as the horse is rolled through the city streets all of the Trojans are partying and dancing after having defeated an entire country. So they leave the horse in the city center for everyone to see. The designer said that their look for the Trojan horse was based on a gorilla statue that was made up of cut up rubber tires. And the patchwork assembly gave them room to make compartments that would open and let soldiers actually climb out of the structure. So when everyone in Troy falls asleep, the Greeks descend from their hiding place and open the gates to start pillaging like no tomorrow. The soldiers are a lot more violent in the ancient retellings. There is no raping or throwing babies shown in this movie. Just regular man on man murder and assault. Through all this chaos, Achilles is seen avoiding literally everyone he passes. Doesn't seem interested in the taking of Troy, but he never really was attacking only two guards that were going to try and stop him. He kills one and asks the other one where he can find Briseis. Aww. And then on top of that, shows mercy to the Trojan. And on top of that, shows mercy to the remaining Trojan soldier. The city is literally falling apart. It's on fire, right? Priam is overlooking the destruction and all of the other royal family members are stuck looking for each other. Paris is standing at the door of the escape tunnel and decides he must stay behind to protect the city. There it is. There is the noble prince we were looking for. And he stops a boy and his father. And the boy is actually Aeneas, like the one main survivor of Troy and then considered the leader of the survivors. But anyways... Paris gives him the sword of Troy because he's a son of Troy and he can keep the Trojan culture alive in the new city that they create. What's your name? Aeneas. Do you know how to use a sword? Yes. The sword of Troy. As long as it remains in the hands of a Trojan, our people have a future. Protect them, Aeneas. Find them a new home. I will. And I'll just say, I've always found families that kiss on the mouth so weird. And Andromache and Paris share a quick smooch before he says a loving goodbye to Helen. And I'll also say, in contrast, that I have always thought that the idea of we'll be together in this world or the next, so romantic. I'll stay with you. Go. Please don't leave me. How could you love me if I ran now? Please. We will be together again. In this world or the next, we will be together. So far, only Helen and Andromache have fled Troy. Everyone else is still running around it somewhere. The Greek soldiers break into what I'm going to assume is the Trojan Palace and make it to another temple. Based on the large pool of water in the middle, I'll also assume this is Poseidon's temple. Priam takes up his own sword and lifts it way up over his head to try and combat the thugs that are destroying the temple. But his outrage is cut short by a spear all the way through the chest, again, but this time by King Agamemnon. Briseis is then seen praying at the feet of a statue of Apollo, tears in her eyes as she looks up to the god for help, when behind her, more Greek soldiers start to appear, including the King of Kings, who then blames Achilles' unwillingness to fight on her seduction of the warrior. And even though we see that Achilles has found her and that he's making his way over the walls and down the steps to reach the altar they are in front of, Briseis surprisingly lets a dagger slide out of her sleeve lowering the hilt into her palm just before she drives it into the neck of the mighty Agamemnon. Even though he's supposed to actually survive the war, it's just very satisfying to see him die by her hands, right? War is young men dying and old men talking. 
This is something Odysseus said early on after they arrived in Troy, but here all the old men die too, so... As Achilles makes it down to the courtyard, he rescues Perseus from the other soldiers that were with the dead king, and then gets down on one knee to help her up from the ground. In this position, he leaves his naked left ankle exposed. And Paris, who is also searching for his cousin, sees the two and decides to shoot an arrow at the Greek hero, not knowing their relationship. In the movie, it looks like Orlando Bloom doesn't have good aim, which I guess is funny because of his Lord of the Rings character and his affiliation with archery. But anyways, the arrow is supposed to be such a bad shot because Apollo helped out by guiding the arrow directly to Achilles' vulnerable spot. But after the only shot that mattered landed in his heel, the prince fired off another four arrows, all hitting him in the exact spot that they did on his straw practice dummy. And all those other arrows did absolutely nothing to harm him. No! <laughs> He had enough time to say goodbye to Perseus and shed another single tear before his wound consumed him. As his countrymen reached the courtyard he was lying in, the fighting stops again because now Achilles was actually dead. There was no mistake of it this time. There was no one else to be impersonating him anymore. We get one last look over the burning city and then it fades into dawn where Achilles' funeral pyre is now being built in the same location as Hector's was. We'll meet again soon, my brother. And they really did. And then in the very end, it's very sad. After his body is burnt, it shows the survivors of Troy fleeing through the mountains on foot. It's mostly women and then like Paris and Helen. Paris in the sea of women, the elderly, and children kind of demonstrates the same sort of cowardice that they show in Titanic when Billy Zane cheats his way onto one of the lifeboats. So you see like Andromache trudging alone, carrying her baby alone after losing her husband who really didn't need to die, right? And then behind her is Paris and Helen in each other's arms, all smiles and kisses, even though they are literally both to blame for everything that happened in this version, because there's no gods, right? Like they're the only two who got exactly what they wanted at the end of the day and really didn't have to pay for it at all. And then like way back in the line, you got just the destroyed Briseis who lost pretty much everything that mattered to her. And she like loses the will to keep marching through the rocks for a second and looks back to the burnt remains of the city that was once her home to see another plume of smoke, but this time it was just Achilles' body being cremated. Even though it's not a happy ending for everyone, it's better than what it could be. Hector's baby son is usually thrown from the Trojan walls to his death, and everyone is like taken slave or murdered too. And I just gotta say it, I find Sean Bean's narration at the beginning and the end so powerful. Like, don't judge me, okay? At the end, when he's standing on top of Achilles' funeral pyre, and he says, it usually does draw out maybe one or two tears, but it could be because I had already been crying so much before we even get to this scene. If they ever tell my story, let them say, I walked with giants. 
Men rise and fall like the winter wheat, but these names will never die. Let them say I lived in the time of Hector, breaker of horses. Let them say I lived in the time of Achilles. But yeah, um, then that's it. So they burn Achilles' body and then it ends, fades to black. So did you like Troy? I know a lot of people will say no because there's a few things they can't forgive about this movie. But come on guys, let me know. And I think the next one of these we're gonna do is actually gonna be about a book. To make this episode, I actually had to watch Troy like at least five or six times all the way through. And then there were times when I was like skipping all around and like pausing and replaying different scenes to really dive deep into whatever was happening. But you know what? I think I actually watched it too much in such a short period of time. I think I'm actually going to not be able to watch this movie and to be able to like properly enjoy it for a while. Because like, I think I mentioned this already, but before this, there were numerous scenes that used to like actually really and truly draw the emotions out of me, good and bad emotions. Most of it was crying, but like there's a couple spots where I'm just like so embarrassed, mostly for Paris, so sorry, Orlando, um, that I typically couldn't watch because the feelings would like take over me. But I found that the last time I watched it all the way through, I wasn't crying when Hector gets slain and then dragged around in front of Priam, or even more when Priam gets killed by uh, Agamemnon when defending his city, but like nothing at all, just business as usual. So I think I got a little numb to it, but time heals all wounds, right? So I'll just take a break from my Troy and move on to another favorite movie of mine and destroy it by watching it over and over again. I don't think anything else is going to be as intense as this episode though, mostly because this is like the first episode and because I think Troy is like a pretty major film and there's like a lot to unpack for like a three-ish hour movie. But thanks for sticking around if you're still here. Oh yeah, and each episode has a question contest. Fun, right? So the question will obviously be about something in the episode and then we'll randomly pick someone from everyone that had the correct answer and then you can win an Oh My Gods t-shirt. Super fun. So the very first question is, which Greek warrior character appears in the movie but is not an original character from mythology? Hmm. But if you want to enter the contest and potentially win the t-shirt, you can go to ohmygods.ca and then go to contest, submit all your information, your t-shirt size, your email, so we can like contact you and tell you that you've won and then your answer. And then if you do win, we'll reach out and set it all up and then boom, all of a sudden you have a free t-shirt. Look at that. Wow, that was a lot of time to talk. I'm not even too sure how long this is actually gonna be. I honestly thought this would only take like half an hour, but I guess not. <laughs> well, congratulations to the both of us for making it to the end of the very first of many episodes on Oh My Gods. Thanks so much for listening. Let's keep this going. So next week, we're going to talk about the real beginning of everything and talk about the Greek myth describing the origin of the universe. So I'll see you then. If you like what you heard, please feel free to follow, subscribe, rate, and all the rest. If you're looking for info or deets, check out ohmygod.ca for the reading slash watching list, as well as a cheat sheet and all of the upcoming episodes. Thanks again for listening. Bye! Bye!